Welcome to our training today. My name is Dr. Aaron Mickelson, and I thank you for taking the time to learn more about our Safety First Culture of Safety journey here at Arizona General Hospital. Each day at our hospital, hundreds of patients are entrusted to our care. Caring for others or supporting those who provide patient care is a responsibility that we each take seriously. It is the reason that we chose a career in healthcare. We each likely can recall a situation that resulted in harm to a patient or employee. The safety of our patients and employees has always been a priority. This safety first, high reliability work is about sharpening our focus to reaffirm our commitment to a culture of safety, adopting and ingraining shared values and beliefs about how we act and interact so that we can make our organization an even safer place with fewer human errors and fewer events of harm. As is customary in our culture at Dignity Health, we will be kicking off the session with a reflection. Today's reflection is brought to you by F.S. Hughes. Safety brings first aid to the uninjured. Here's our goal for today, to learn about our commitment at Dignity Health to reduce preventable harm to patients and employees. There are three supporting objectives. First, we'll talk about how humans experience errors and events of harm occur. Second, we'll learn how we can prevent errors in this complex, high-risk environment in which we work, both clinically and non-clinically. Finally, we'll learn about our safety behaviors and error prevention tools and practice using them. As we conclude the session, we'll be asking each of you to make a commitment to practice the error prevention tools and make them a part of your work habits. I want to share a story with you that highlights why this training is so important. The little 18-month-old girl you see here in the picture is Josie King. You're going to hear a story from Josie's mother, Sorrel King, about how preventable medical errors impacted their family. My daughter Josie died a year and a half ago at Johns Hopkins due to medical errors. Not only do I represent Josie, but I also represent all of the other children, the mothers, the fathers, the sisters, the brothers, the 98,000 people who die every year in this country from medical errors. I'm here for them for their families, and for any future potential victims. I would like to share my story with you. I do this with the hope that what I'm about to tell you will make a difference in how you care for your patients and how strongly committed you and your hospital are to patient safety. Josie was 18 months old. She had brown eyes and light brown hair. She loved to dance and had just learned to bounce on the trampoline with her older siblings, Jack, Relly, and Eva. She had just learned to say, I love you. In January of 2001, Josie was admitted to Johns Hopkins after suffering first and second degree burns from climbing into a hot bath. She healed well and within weeks was scheduled for release. Two days before she was to return home, she died of severe dehydration and misused narcotics. Her central line had been taken out. I began noticing that every time she saw a drink, she would scream for it, and I thought this was strange. I was told not to let her drink. While a nurse and I gave her a bath, she sucked furiously on a washcloth. As I put her to bed, I noticed that her eyes were rolling back in her head. Although I asked the nurse to call the doctor, she reassured me that oftentimes children did this and her vitals were fine. I told her Josie had never done this, and perhaps another nurse could look at her. After yet another reassurance from another nurse that everything was fine, I was told that it was okay for me to sleep at home. I called to check in two times during the night and returned to the hospital at 5.30 in the morning. I took one look at Josie and demanded that a doctor come at once. She was not fine. Josie's medical team arrived arrived and administered two shots of Narcan. I asked if she could have something to drink. The request was approved and Josie gulped down nearly a liter of juice. Verbal orders were issued for there to be no narcotics given. Meanwhile, Josie started perking up. She was more alert and had kept all the liquids down. I was still scared and asked her doctors to please stay close by. At one o'clock, the nurse walked over with a syringe of methadone. Alarmed, I told her there had been an order for no narcotics. 
She said the orders had been changed and administered the drug. Josie's heart stopped as I was rubbing her feet. Her eyes were fixed and I screamed for help. I stood helpless as a crowd of doctors and nurses came running into her room. I was ushered into a small room with a chaplain. The next time I saw Josie, she had been moved back up to the PQ. Doctors and nurses were standing around her bed. No one seemed to want to look at me. She was hooked up to many machines and her leg was black and blue. I looked into their faces and said to them, you did this to her, now you must fix her. I was told to pray. Two days later, Jack, Relly, and Eva were brought to the hospital to kiss their beloved Josie goodbye. Josie was taken off of life support. She died in our arms on a snowy night in what's considered to be one of the best hospitals in the world. Our lives were shattered and changed forever. Josie died from severe dehydration and misused narcotics, careless human errors. Josie's death was not the fault of one doctor or one nurse or one misplaced decimal point. It was the result of a total breakdown in the system. It was the result of a complete lack of communication between the different teams. It was the result of doctors and nurses not listening to a concerned parent. It was the result of a combination of many errors, all of which were avoidable. What if the nurse had called the doctor when Josie's eyes were rolling back in her head? What if she could have had a drink or had been hooked up to an IV? What if the residents had paid attention and seen that her weight had dropped over 15% in 24 hours? What if the nurse had not given her the methadone? What if someone had taken my concerns seriously? What if a patient safety program had been in place? I believe that if any one of these things had occurred, the outcome could have been different and Josie would be here today. Unfortunately, Josie didn't die alone. Research shows us just how dangerous American healthcare can be. From the research, it is estimated that 440,000 patients die each year from preventable errors. If it were a disease state, it would be the third leading cause of death in the U.S. behind heart disease and cancer. One in 25 hospitalized patients develop a preventable hospital infection. Preventable harm costs on average $2,000 per discharge across the United States. Preventable harm does not stop there. In a January 2020 article, the Press Ganey Chief Safety and Transformation Officer discussed the persistent and widespread inequities in health outcomes in the United States based on race, sex, language, socioeconomic class, and other demographic factors. They noted that our systems have been constructed, usually unintentionally, to deliver outcomes that vary according to factors such as patient's skin color or their ability to pay for services. High reliability means doing the right thing every single time for every single person. Our outcomes show that isn't happening. Now, as healthcare people, we love to debate numbers. There are probably some of you thinking these numbers can't be right. They seem very large. It simply doesn't matter what the exact number is. The simple fact is that we are hurting too many people and we're not getting better fast enough. To reach these goals, safety must be everyone's business, even if you're not actively touching a patient. Reliability does not just have an effect on clinical areas, but all areas of operations in healthcare. I wanna share a story with you about one of these events. In November and December of 2004, maintenance workers from Automatic Elevator, a firm that services hospitals elevators, drained hydraulic fluid from elevators into empty containers that had previously held surgical detergent. The containers were not properly relabeled or securely stored. Cardinal Health, the firm that provides surgical detergent to the Duke Health System, picked the containers up, restocked, and then shipped them as detergent back to several hospitals, where it was then used in the cleaning process for surgical instruments at two Duke hospitals. The mix-up was not immediately noticed, in part because the detergent used by those hospitals and the hydraulic fluid had a similar color and consistency. By the time the error was discovered, over 3,800 patients had been affected by the series of errors. During this time, the surgeons were saying, the instrument seemed to be a little more slick. The staff in sterile processing were saying, the soap looked a little darker and smelled a little different, yet no one took the next step and asked why. Nobody had a good questioning attitude or felt empowered to stop the line when something didn't seem right. 
It wasn't until the second hospital central sterilization staff displayed a questioning attitude, opened the barrel, took the fluid out of the process, and called Cardinal with concerns that this error was discovered and resolved. Clinical and non-clinical staff all play a part in patient safety. We never know how our actions or lack of actions may affect the safety of our patients. Everyone should have a healthy questioning attitude and feel comfortable voicing a safety concern, asking a question, or stopping the line when something doesn't seem right. We should think of it as our moral obligation to our patients and fellow staff members. So how do we get there? How do we reduce the errors that we are making? By becoming more highly reliable in our work. The pictures you see here all represent industries that practice reliability skills to prevent errors in their work. Errors that have the potential to have a catastrophic impact on people. Naval aviation, commercial aviation, and nuclear power all represent high reliability organizations. HROs are ultra-safe entities that work to dramatically reduce the probability of accidents and mishaps through concerted efforts such as the techniques we will discuss later in this presentation. This means that these organizations actively focus on error prevention or that they are doing something every day to help prevent errors in their work that could have potentially catastrophic outcomes. Even in departments that are not providing direct patient care, you make errors that affect your work. These skills are just as applicable to non-clinical areas as clinical. Almost every tool we are going to be teaching you today was not invented in healthcare and have been used by other industries with undeniable proof that these skills have worked to make the workplace safer for all. Before we describe the behaviors we want to develop into practice habits to reduce human error, let's first take a look at how humans make errors and how the brain functions when we go about our busy day. This is the Swiss cheese model invented by researcher James Reeson, a psychologist studying events in aviation. This model explains how human error results in events of harm. In most everything we do, there are checks and barriers built into the system to help catch errors and prevent them from resulting in events. This is called defense in depth. As a reminder, the slices of Swiss cheese represent these defenses. Healthcare is designed with defense in depth to prevent a single error from causing harm. Good defenses can include technology, such as a pharmacy order entry system that warns the pharmacist of potential drug interactions, processes and policies, other people, such as co-workers. Sometimes, however, these good checks and barriers fail, seen as holes in the Swiss cheese. These are also called latent weaknesses. These are flaws in how the barrier is built, or flaws that we sometimes work to insert, such as workarounds or shortcuts. When all our best defenses fail us, an error that otherwise would have been caught carries through the holes, unstopped, and results in a safety event. On average, a serious safety event is the result of 8.3 barriers failing. We can find and fix the holes in the Swiss cheese by good detection and correction. Becoming more comfortable reporting errors and events when they occur without fear of repercussion or reprisal is the first step. When the holes are discovered through good IRIS reporting or root cause analysis, they need to be fixed by leaders, or if resources are not available, other barriers need to be put in place. While we can never completely eliminate human error, by employing some low-risk behaviors, we can significantly reduce our error rate and consequently our event rate by 50 to 80 percent. This is going to be our focus today, learning how to make fewer errors using some simple safety behaviors for error prevention. Humans experience three different types of errors, skill-based errors, rule-based errors, and knowledge-based errors. The skill rule knowledge classification was developed by Jens Rasmussen, a cognitive systems engineer from Denmark. The name of the error type describes the mode that your brain is in at the time you experience the error. Each mode represents a different level of familiarity we have with the task being performed and degree of conscious thought that we apply when performing the task. We'll talk about each mode of human performance, the types of errors we experience in each, and specific error prevention strategies. In skill-based performance, you're performing very routine, frequent acts in familiar environments. Because there is such a high degree of familiarity and muscle memory with the task, little to no conscious thought has to be applied when performing the act. Think about driving to work this morning. You likely had to apply very little critical thought. You could do this action on autopilot because you have done it so many times. Skill-based errors occur in three varieties. Slips are errors of commission. The act is performed wrong. Putting the milk in the pantry instead of the refrigerator is a classic example of a skill-based slip. Lapses are errors of omission. A required act is not performed. You forget to put the milk in the refrigerator and leave it sitting on the kitchen table after breakfast. Fumbles are motor skill errors. You knock over the milk when reaching to pick it up. 
We can reduce the number of skill-based errors we make by paying attention to the task at hand. Stop and think before taking action. Later, we will discuss a self-checking technique called STAR as an error prevention tool to prevent skill-based errors. The probability of experiencing a skill-based error is approximately one error for every 1,000 acts, or 0.1%. Humans are very reliable when in skill-based performance because we have a great deal of practice and expertise in performing the task. But the average person performs around 10,000 skill-based acts each day, meaning that we experience about 10 skill-based errors per day. So don't be surprised when you make them. Remember, we're all humans. These kinds of errors are easy to identify. The surprise of detecting one's error in such a simple action leads to a slap on the forehead, the international symbol of a skill-based error. In rule-based performance, you perceive a situation and your brain scans for a rule, usually learned through education or experience, and you act to apply the rule. In this use, the term rule means more than policy or law. Rules describe our knowledge of how the world works, learned operating principles. We have rules for everything. For example, oil and water do not mix, and what goes up must come down. Rule-based errors occur in three varieties, wrong rule, misapplication of a rule, and noncompliance. Wrong rule errors occur when an incorrect answer is learned as the right answer. What happens the first two weeks of the year when you write a check and you add the year to the end of the date? You have to unlearn the wrong rule. This error prevention strategy for a wrong rule error is to teach your colleague the correct rule. This is the error type that is appropriately addressed by education, our typical RCA action item. Misapplication of a rule occurs when your thinking becomes confused. This is not a knowledge problem, you know the right answer, but a critical thinking problem. Noncompliance occurs when the rule is known and thought about at the time, but a choice is made to do otherwise, usually thinking that a better result can be achieved with the same or less effort. For example, shortcutting seatbelt use when you're in a hurry. For noncompliance, the coaching is to either reinforce a professional standard or teach the risk or consequence of the noncompliance. The probability of experiencing a rule-based error is 1 in 100, or 1%. This is also a pretty reliable mode for humans. Experts live in rule-based thinking. They know what to do, and they stop when they don't know what to do. In knowledge-based performance, you're problem-solving in a new or unfamiliar situation. You don't know the rules, or perhaps no rule exists for the situation, and you certainly don't have an established skill. You lack or have very little familiarity with the task, and a high degree of conscious thought must be applied to figure it out. This mode could be better called lack of knowledge-based performance, because you're outside your area of practice or facing a very complex case. The best strategy to prevent knowledge-based error is to stop when you find yourself in knowledge-based performance and find an expert source, someone or something that can provide the rules. If you see a coworker operating in knowledge-based performance, intervene to stop them and offer assistance or help them find an expert source. Change your knowledge-based error into someone else's rule-based success. Physicians have an excellent strategy for preventing knowledge-based errors, calling for a consult. If the case is complex or beyond the physician's experience or expertise, they consult with a specialist who knows the rules. In knowledge-based performance, 30 to 60 of 100 decisions will be the wrong ones, a very high probability of human error. Now that you understand how events occur, we need to think about how it relates to us here in the Southwest Division of Common Spirit. Through examination of events that have occurred in our facilities, we discovered that every 1.2 days, there is a preventable serious safety event experienced by the patients we serve, and every 22.3 days, there is a preventable death. There are several common causes of the reliability failures in our hospitals and clinics that led to these harm events occurring. The items you see here on the screen are representative of those reliability failures. This includes normalized deviance or when there is conforming to an individual standard, type, or custom where the behavior is sharply different from the generally accepted practice standard. Think, this is the way we just do this activity or procedure around here. And individuals may or may not know better as deviation in this behavior is typically learned or conformed to. The tools you are learning about today, if learned and reinforced, will close the gap on these common reliability failures. So here's our toolkit, our safety first universal skills behaviors. We will be covering these in depth today. This toolkit can be broken down very simply as we are asking you to commit to five things. Pay attention, think critically, talk about it, be a good team member, show humanity and kindness to others. Let's dive in to learn more. Our toolkit starts with discussing how we treat each other. These represent our values. 
We can live out our commitment to these values in our behaviors and the words we use. These are also representative of the tones that we carry when we approach our work, our coworkers, and our patients and their families. Our words impact safety, and we will talk about this more in the We Communicate Clearly tools. However, the tone when we speak and our actions have a more profound impact. The blue pie chart illustrates a study by Dr. Albert Morabian, a psychologist and professor at UCLA. Morabian was interested in the impact of verbal and nonverbal communication on our impressions of each other. His curiosity focused primarily on the effect of inconsistent messaging. The study found that in deciding whether to like someone or trust someone, a person's body language and vocal tone was worth 93%. Words count for only 7%. This is why it is important to not only put our values in action with the correct actions, but to also ensure that we have an alignment between our words, tones, and body as we carry out the values. For our values to be effective, we need to practice them all the time, everywhere. We can live out our value of compassion by making eye contact, smiling, and greeting. Easy enough. Some refer to this as the 10-5 rule. At 10 feet, you smile. At 5 feet, you say hello. As simple as smiling and greeting is, there is truly a science behind this tone. We have three to seven seconds to make a judgment about a person. Can we trust this person? It goes back to our primitive instinct to determine if we are in a safe situation. Next, smiling. When you smile, your body releases endorphins. Endorphins send a message to your brain that makes you feel good. When you smile at someone, they tend to smile back at you, partially unconsciously, and endorphins get released in their body. A genuine smile and greeting triggers our unconscious mind, indicating the situation is safe. I can carry on. Eye contact, smiling, and a greeting decreases inherent fear and silence. We should do this in every interaction, as that person may be our next customer or friend, as this is also an example of treating others with compassion. We can live at our value of inclusion by introducing ourselves, our roles, and referring to others by preferred, usually their first name. Introducing yourself and your role decreases fears. You're creating a psychologically safe space with the other person. They understand with whom they are speaking. Using preferred names allows the other person to recognize that you recognize them as a person. Additionally, addressing people using their preferred name furthers the display of respect. When in doubt, ask them how they prefer to be addressed. For many people, being addressed by their preferred name can make or break a relationship. And this isn't just for elderly people or professionals with credentials like doctor or general. In a recent study at the University of Texas, researchers took a closer look at the importance of a name for young people and found that participants who were allowed to use their chosen name at work, school, or at home showed a lower risk of depression and suicide. We should do this in every interaction when greeting others, using direct communication, or meeting a person for the first time, as this displays our value of inclusion. We can live out our value of integrity by listening with empathy and intent to understand, perhaps our best tone. Listening with empathy drives connection because we're taking the perspective of another person, staying out of judgment while we're doing so, and recognizing emotion in that person. Listening with empathy means that we're seeking to understand the other person, seeing through their eyes, feeling what they feel as they're talking with us. Listening is a skill to be practiced. Did you know that even when you're really interested in what a person is saying, you only hear on average one third of the message? When you think about communication classes you had in school, how many of them focused on listening? Likely very few. That is why this is a skill that we must practice continually in every interaction, all the time, treating others with integrity. We can live out our value of excellence by communicating positive intent of your actions and assuming positive intent in the actions of your colleagues as well, and one that will also need practice. Communicating positive intent of your actions means letting people know what you're doing and why you're doing it. If a person does not understand our actions because you have not explained them, great offense could be taken, as well as great misunderstandings. Next, and very importantly, assume positive intent in the actions of your colleagues. Everyone wants to do a good job, and we're all trying to put the patient first. We should do this in every interaction to display our commitment to excellence. Finally, we can live out our value of collaboration by providing opportunities for others to ask questions. By providing others the opportunity, we are clarifying our communication to the receiver and providing ourselves with a better understanding of the situation. Acknowledge that patients and perhaps even new employees are very likely fearful. Answering their questions can help reduce this fear. Indicators of their concern can also be expressed in facial expressions and nonverbal behavior. Get attuned at reading people you're speaking with. 
You can prompt questions and extend help by asking at the end of each and every contact, what questions do you have? This statement empowers the other person to ask a question. We should do this anytime we have provided information. Now that we've set the tone for how we should treat each other, our patients, and their families, let's dive into our error prevention or universal skills safety first tools. The first drawer that we will learn about is the way of behaving. We communicate clearly. Communicating clearly is about making sure we send and hear things correctly and understand the information. This is very important because we act on information others give us and our coworkers act on information we give them. So we need to make sure the information exchange occurs correctly to prevent wrong assumptions and misunderstandings. When we communicate poorly, inaccurate and incomplete information can lead us to make decision-making errors or poor choices. There are three error prevention tools for this safety behavior that we're going to discuss now in more detail. Some of you may have heard them before or may be using them, but we want to re-emphasize the need for consistency in practice. They are the three-way repeat back or read back, numeric and phonetic clarifications, and using SBAR for action. For information to be transferred effectively, it needs to be clear, complete, and accurate. It also needs to be both sent and received. In order to cut down on communication errors, the aviation industry repeats back all information in flight between pilots and air traffic controllers, and this is done for every takeoff, landing, or change of altitude. So as an example, the pilots may say, Houston Center, this is United 321, request a descent to 8,000 feet. The controller would respond, United 321, this is Houston Center, you are clear to descend to and maintain 8,000 feet. Then to close the loop, the pilots would say, United 321, 8,000 feet, roger. This kind of three-way communication happens hundreds of times a day on each and every aircraft. How have they made something like this stick in the aviation industry? In a word, culture. It's just the way they do things, and each and every day it prevents miscommunication errors and misunderstandings that could lead to terrible accidents. Let's describe how we want to use this concept here at Dignity Health. In a repeat back, the sender initiates the communication. The receiver acknowledges the information by repeating it back. The sender then acknowledges accuracy by closing the loop with the phrase, that's correct which is like the pilots in our previous example saying Roger to the air traffic controllers. Since repeat backs are not a common practice in our normal lives, sometimes you have to invite yourself in. A good safety phrase to do this is, let me repeat that back. That's your way of saying, I need a second and I wanna make sure I have this perfectly clear by repeating it back to you. It also tells the receiver you're expecting to hear a that's correct when you're done sending the information. The third step in which the sender acknowledges the accuracy of the repeat back is so important. The receiver must listen for the words, that's correct. If the information is not correct, the sender must repeat the communication. A bad practice is to say that's right, because right goes with left, and there could be confusion at times in terms of procedures involving laterality. In all of our hospitals, we want the phrase, that's correct, to become a safety code word. Because the chance of errors is so high during verbal orders, the Joint Commission requires a repeat back slash read back whenever giving verbal orders, whether over the phone or in person, or when reporting critical test values. The best practice in combating these errors in communication is to write down what you heard, and you read back what you've just written, not what you heard, which is an important distinction. This confirms you have recorded it correctly, so when you go to carry out the order, you have it right. The sender continues to have a role in this communication and should still close the loop with the phrase, that's correct, to ensure it was read back accurately. Always read back orders given over the phone, critical information such as critical lab values, any information that needs to be added to a patient medical record, or any information that needs to be passed on to another individual. Moving on to our next tool, numeric clarifications. Numeric clarifications is where we say the number and then say the digits to avoid confusion with the sound-alike numbers, like 15 and 50. If a nurse is given a verbal order to give a patient 15 units of insulin, in his or her mind, they may wonder, was that 15 or 50? A best practice is to commit to saying 15 units, that's 1-5, compared to 50 units, that's 5-0. Clear and concise, and we use the separating word that's to avoid any confusion between the number and the digits. The best times to use numeric clarifications are when communicating the following. 
medication doses, critical lab values, equipment set points, patient identification numbers, or any number we are communicating. Additionally, we need to commit to using those leading zeros where the decimal point is a placeholder. This situation is so important because if we mess this one up, we automatically get an order of magnitude error in our communications. We see pretty good commitment to the written use of leading zeros in front of decimal points, but overall, there is still room for improvement in the verbal use of leading zeros. The correct way to say that example at the bottom is 0 0.9, which helps train the tongue to say, the ear to hear, and the eye to see each and every time, making us much more reliable in our verbal communications. Clarification doesn't stop with numbers. It is also used with letters of phonetics. Phonetic clarification is a good practice to use when communicating verbally. Words transmitted via early radio communications were often difficult to understand. Since radio became an important tool of military operations, the U.S. Armed Forces have used several different phonetic alphabets to aid in clear communications. The phonetic alphabet shown on this slide has been in use since 1957 and is also used by the shipping industry, commercial aviation, and nuclear power. Other phonetic alphabets are available. As our organizations are growing more diverse in cultures from around the world, this brings different accents that sometimes make understanding a person's spoken word difficult. Phonetic clarifications assist with decreasing confusion and misunderstanding of spoken words. This slide shows us an anti-phonetic alphabet where words are used inappropriately for certain letter sounds. For example, N as in gnome, or F as in phone. These are systems that we want to avoid using in our workplaces. They can cause confusion. We're often asked, do I have to memorize this alphabet? No, but you'll find in practice it's more efficient, practical, and consistent to learn it and use it consistently and correctly across the organization. So we want to set it as the standard across our hospitals. Many users of the phonetic alphabet make up the words as they go. For example, you can say A as an apple, but as you do this, you'll be surprised how often people get stuck on simple letters and pick whatever pops into their heads. So a commitment to learning and memorizing a single phonetic alphabet reduces mental effort over time. What is critical is that we use phonetic clarification when we are communicating important information, such as patient names, procedure or test names, or medication names. You do not have to spell the words phonetically. That would just slow things down. But here you can see some good examples of when you could use this technique. For example, neurology consult to room 405, that's neurology with an N as in November. Code blue in room 330B, that's B as in Bravo. SBAR is the communication style and checklist we want to use as we hand off or transfer patients, materials, tasks, or information. It is a tool that helps structure the information so we don't miss anything. SBAR as a communication protocol was developed by Kaiser Healthcare, but has also been credited to the Nuclear Navy, where submariners have used it for years to clearly and accurately transfer information in a time-critical manner. After identifying yourself and or the patient, project, task, etc., step through the following, saying each word prior to giving the information. Situation, which is the immediate problem or the headline. Background, a brief description of relevant history related to the condition. Assessment, your view of the situation. I think the problem is, or I'm not sure what the problem is, and your perception of the urgency of action. The patient is deteriorating rapidly, or we won't be able to continue service without more supplies. And then finally, recommendation. Your suggestion about the action that should be taken to solve the problem, or your request for guidance on what action to take. When communicating clearly, Specifically use the words situation, background, assessment, and recommendation so that the listener knows the nature of the information you're giving. SBAR can be used for both verbal conversations as well as written communications. Also want to remind you that the method of communication can be used in every department, clinical or non-clinical. A non-clinical example you see on the screen here. So for example, this is an email from Rob, the supervisor from the maintenance shop. The situation is that there's a water leak on 5 East. The background is we have some contractors doing plumbing work in the four new ICU rooms on 5 East, and they made a cut in a pipe that was not previously isolated. Water is spraying everywhere. The assessment is that we've got to stop the leak as soon as possible as it's making a trip hazard in the hallways. 
and the recommendation is to ask non-essential personnel to leave Five East and make a public address announcement to have all site maintenance personnel to report to Five East. This is a great example of a non-clinical SBAR. Let's move on to the next drawer in our toolkit and talk about the importance and power of asking questions. By exercising your questioning attitude, you are improving your critical thinking skills and escalation skills. You can do this by questioning information you hear if it doesn't fit in with what we know or understand. There are two error prevention tools for this safety behavior. Pause, question, and confirm, and ask clarifying questions. Questioning attitude is not about asking questions. It's about questioning the answers. We're trying to detect information and incorrect assumptions that can lead to bad decisions or actions. Having a questioning attitude helps ensure that we correctly perceive the conditions around us and that we correctly choose the right response for the situation. Pause, question, and confirm is the number one critical thinking tool out of 20 that were studied in the nuclear power industry. It is a two-step technique for processing raw information into fact. First, we need to recognize situations or raw information that doesn't seem quite right. The raw information can be from any source, such as direct observation, results of tests as labs, images, etc., displays from monitors and devices, verbal or written orders, guidance documents, such as policies or protocols. Let's dive a little deeper into this concept. Questioning is an internal check. Does this situation or the information that has been given to me make sense with what I know to be true or right? It takes seconds to do and is sometimes called the gray matter check because it occurs in your brain. Think of it like an internal smoke detector. Just like the smoke detector in your home, your internal detector should always be on. Whenever you receive information or observe a situation, you should be asking yourself questions like, does this make sense to me? Is this right based on what I know about these types of situations or this case specifically? Is this what I expected based on the name of the case, the diagnosis, the plan of care, or things we talked about yesterday? Does this fit in? Is it consistent with what I know and expect? Take the time to internally question every situation and information that you encounter. It takes just a few seconds to run this check in your head. Always think, does it make sense to me? Just like the smoke detector, questioning costs very little and can save thousands of lives every year. Confirming is an external check of the information with an independent and credible source to corroborate our thinking. It takes minutes to do, sometimes many minutes, and as opposed to occurring in the gray matter, this occurs with the shoe leather, because you have to get on your feet and do some work to track down the right answer. Confirm by finding an independent, qualified source to ensure the situation or information is correct. What are some qualified sources you rely on to confirm information? Policies, procedures, and job aids clinical protocols and guidelines of care, reference manuals, expert individuals, or chain of command, charge nurses, supervisors, or managers. There are three specific instances when you must confirm information. When you note an inconsistency, your internal validation detector goes off, any high-risk situation, or when the plan of action changes. When using other professionals as your source, make sure the person really is an expert. Coworkers are not always the best expert, as people who work closely together tend to share the same perspectives and understandings of situations and information. It may feel uncomfortable to ask about something you think you should know, but think about how you will feel if you don't ask and make a mistake or error. This is a video of a doctor you're probably familiar with, Dr. House. He is using some of the critical thinking techniques we just discussed. Pausing questioning in his mind, and confirming with a patient by requesting an action. As you listen in, think about how he is questioning and confirming. My asthma. They said they'd fix it, but it didn't make any difference at all. Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Yet. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? The next tool in the Ask Questions drawer is Clarifying Questions. Clarifying questions probe for understanding and can be asked by the sender or by the receiver. 
Do you always have to ask clarifying questions? No, pick your spots. Most certainly ask clarifying questions in these situations, when in high risk situations, when information is incomplete, when information is ambiguous or not clear. Studies have shown that the probability of making a wrong assumption is reduced two and a half times when you ask clarifying questions. One to two clarifying questions is the right number. One question usually isn't enough, but more than three clarifying questions can become a bit annoying. Some points to emphasize. Recall the repeat back technique does not ensure the sender sent accurate information or that the receiver understood the information. So it's always a good practice to use repeat backs or read backs and clarifying questions together. A good way to telegraph your need for understanding in the interest of safety is by saying the safety and reliability phrase, may I ask a clarifying question? People then are much more receptive of the questions. If you just ask the question directly, it sounds like you're challenging them or their knowledge, when in reality, you just want to help understand the situation. This video will give you a visual example of using clarifying questions. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Let's move on now to the final drawer in our Ways of Behaving Toolkit. You are responsible. The first tool we will discuss is associated with paying attention to detail. Paying attention to detail prevents us from making skill-based errors, those unintended slips and lapses when we perform familiar, routine acts as if we're on autopilot without even thinking. There is one error prevention tool for this safety habit, and that is self-checking using STAR. Paying attention to detail means to add intention to those safety-critical tasks, to slow down when the hand is operating before the head. We're trying to reduce unintentional errors when we're under time pressure, distracted, or stressed. Those skill-based errors that you learned about earlier. For example, have you ever sent an email without an attachment? Have you ever locked your keys in your car or forgotten to label a specimen? The tool we're going to teach you about, STAR, reduces your chances of making an unintended mental slip or lapse by more than 10 times. We will cover this tool in just a moment. There are conditions that actually increase the likelihood of experiencing many of the actions on the prior slide. These errors are so simple that we are very much surprised when we make them. When we make a skill-based error, we slap our forehead in disbelief, the international sign of a skill-based error. For example, have you ever been working under time pressure? Have you had distractions or interruptions or felt exhausted or just are not paying attention? People who develop a good habit using STAR use the techniques as many as 500 times per day. This amounts to less than 10 minutes per day. While there are times when we need to work fast or hurry throughout our day, we need to pause at the most critical points of no return to make sure our acts are the right ones. Remember, studies have shown that using STAR can reduce your chances of making an unintended mental slip or lapse by more than 10 times. Skill-based errors are not just about inconveniences. They can also have tragic consequences. In July 2004, Edward Hines, who was a carpet cleaner for Stanley Steamer in Inverness, Florida, was supposed to drop his three-month-old daughter, Mackenzie, off at daycare before going to work. Instead, he parked his car in a lot near his office and walked next door to start his 7 a.m. shift driving a yellow company van to area homes. Sometimes before 3 p.m., Hines stopped for gas at a Chevron near his workplace. His wife called his cell phone and asked why the baby wasn't at daycare. Hines ran across the busy US-41 to the parking lot, but was too late. His daughter, who had been strapped to her car seat the whole time, was pronounced dead at the scene by paramedics. Authorities said the body's temperature registered 106 degrees, 15 minutes after it was placed in an air-conditioned ambulance. Unfortunately, there were multiple additional events like this in the news after this event in 2004. Did the father intend to do this? No. 
Skill-based errors can be much more than inconvenient. Why do you think he forgot to drop off his daughter at daycare? His brain was an autopilot like many of us can get into. He was executing his routine that normally did not include dropping off his daughter at daycare. STAR is recognized as one of the best tools for avoiding skill-based errors. STAR stands for Stop, Think, Act, and Review. In STAR, you pause for one to two seconds, consider your action, concentrate, and carry out the task. And then, if you have time, review to make sure you got it right. STAR was developed in the 1970s in the California school system to help prevent school children from acting impulsively. Kids were coached to stop and think about the consequences before acting. Two professional groups then adopted STAR, aircraft pilots and nuclear power operators. These are professions where pressing the wrong button without thinking can result in very bad consequences very quickly. The nuclear power industry developed simulators to help people use the STAR technique. You actually have a good simulator here in the hospital. It's called the vending machine. People put their money into the machine, point to the candy bar that they want, point to the letter and number for the slot, and right before pushing the final number, they will pause for a second to ensure that they've got it right. The best times to use STAR are when going from thought to action. Identifying a patient, entering data into a device or computer, documenting a thought or value, connecting tubing or leads, and any time before taking action with a patient. Stop is the most important part of STAR, to give your brain a chance to catch up with your hands. Sometimes people say or think that when you're in an emergency situation, this is when you can bypass the rules. This is the time when use of these tools are the most critical. The next tool we will learn about is cross-checking and coaching each other. Cross-checking means that we look out for one another and are not afraid to ask questions if we think someone has made an error. The most important part of these steps is to be willing to be checked, which establishes a more collegial environment where we are not so sensitive to input or criticism. When we are working together, we should be looking out for our fellow team members. Be aware not just of what you're doing, but of the status of the working environment and what others around us are doing as well. Offer to check the work of others, second check a calculation, proofread a memo, offer to help a team member with their work. Point out work conditions or hazards that your team member might not have noticed, a floor that was recently mopped, a trip hazard in the lobby. Point out unintended slips and lapses, a supply room key left on the counter, an order placed in the wrong chart. Demonstrate a willingness to be checked by saying, thanks for the cross check. Add this to our list of safety phrases. This is called being mutually supportive. Remember, the key to successful checking is not only to be willing to check others, but to be willing to have others check us. This is so important to establishing that collegial environment where it's okay and non-threatening to have someone point out an error or question an action without fear of retaliation. Cross-checking and coaching is not just about error trapping. It is also about praising the behaviors that we want to see repeated from our peers. Let's watch a video that discusses the power of positive feedback and the amount we should be providing to each other. Over the course of a day, we give more feedback, good feedback, and bad feedback than we would ever imagine. In a minute, I will share some startling research about the right kind of mix between positive and critical feedback. But first, let's kind of set the stage and imagine a day. It might be like this. You get up in the morning, your teenager comes down and you say, you left every single light in the house on. And by the way, don't ask for the car until the living room is suitably clean to have people over. You thank your spouse for agreeing to go to your parents' house. That meant a lot to you. You get in the car and you start giving some feedback when somebody cuts you off. First you give them the horn, then you give them the finger. You get to work and you say, Mary, it's so great to have you back. The staff meeting feels normal with you here again. But when two people come in late to the staff meeting and say, what has happened to the professionalism around here? It's just not what it used to be. Come on, guys. You point out to Gary that he's done great work in the past, but the memo he's done isn't really up to snuff. You head off to lunch, go off with a vendor. You say, I loved your proposal. Quality was great. Price was great. Things are good. You tell the waitress, chicken here was really a little bit dry. And on the way out, you tell the manager the service was fantastic, but you thought he'd want to know that the bathroom was below sanitary conditions. And so goes your day. Lots of feedback. What you wonder, though, don't you, is what is the right mix? What's the appropriate balance between positive feedback and constructive feedback over a period of time? 
Balance, well, here's some balance. This looks pretty average, doesn't it? Five negative, four positive. In fact, this is dead wrong. John Gottman, a researcher on marriage, has been able to ter determine with 94% accuracy which couples will be divorced simply by watching their behaviors. And this is the average ratio for couples that divorce usually quite quickly. Five negative comments to four positive. Really, pretty balanced, pretty close, and really wrong. Instead, what Gottman found was this, that in those marriages that lasted and where people had positive relationships and felt good about their marriage, the ratio was one, two, three, four, five positive comments for every negative comment. It's a pretty high standard. Remarkably, it's not just at home, but even at work. A study by uh, Barbara Fredrickson and Marshall Lasado, where they watched teams and they found the high performing teams, found that there was a ratio of one, two, three to one, which was the tipping point when there were three positives for one negative. These teams began to perform at higher levels. Their ideal, their recommendation, five to one. Five to one, both at work and at home. So the question for us is, what are we carrying around in our pockets? I would suggest we need to be thinking five positives for every negative. If we really want to be effective, we really want to be happy, and we want to lead with our best selves. We'd like to introduce a safety escalation tool called Cuss with Kindness. So what should we do? We need to recognize that we are safer when we work together and escalate concerns in a professional manner. We should report errors that we make or errors that we witness. And why should we do this? To speak up for safety, to catch and trap honest errors before they reach our patients or our coworkers, to hold each other accountable for meeting practice expectations. Our next tool, in our You Are Responsible To drawer is Cuss With Kindness. So Cuss With Kindness is an assertion and escalation technique. It should be used and received in a manner of mutual respect using the lightest touch possible. Speaking up for safety using Cuss can help us assert a concern in a non-threatening way when our efforts to check and coach a coworker are being met with resistance. First, attempt to check a colleague by expressing, I have a concern. If that discomfort is not alleviated, escalate and express that you are uncomfortable with the situation. If your discomfort is not alleviated, escalate and express that you think that work activities should be stopped. Finally, if you perceive unsafe conditions still exist, then you should take it to the next level by turning to your supervisor. This action is not being taken to get the other person in trouble, but rather to have another set of eyes on the situation. Cuss can be especially helpful if we feel hesitant or intimidated to raise a concern to someone we perceive to be in a position of higher authority. For example, a nurse speaking with a physician or a lab technician speaking with a nurse. Whenever somebody says they're concerned, that should set off bells and whistles in our heads, causing us to stop and address why this person has the genuine worry that we're about to harm a patient. We should consider these words, concern, uncomfortable, stop, and supervisor, as safety code words that everyone knows and practices. Speaking up for safety has the potential to save lives. Everyone has a voice. Use that voice to create situational awareness as you may see things that others do not. Using cuss creates a common language that clarifies communication and allows for quick escalation and resolution. If you observe a situation you believe may compromise the safety of a patient or employee, you have a responsibility to raise that concern. Cuss gives you permission to escalate the safety concern if it is not adequately addressed. Being a good team member means that we look out for each other and speak up when necessary. However, sometimes it is hard to speak up for safety, but why? Power distance. Power distance is a term coined by a Dutch researcher named Gerrit Hofstede, who defined it as the extent to which the lower ranking individual of a society accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. It is that person's perception. Hofstede actually measured power distance in different countries. 
He found that in countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, and numerous Latin American countries, there is a very high power distance, and you simply do not question superiors or cross gender or professional authority gradients. Power distance is not necessarily a bad thing. In most situations, someone has to be in charge and make decisions. Power distance turns bad when it drives authority gradient, which is, has been found in healthcare to stifle people speaking up to those they feel are in higher power, more tenure, or experience. Overall, in the United States, we have moderate power distance, but in certain industries and professional groups, including physicians and nurses, it's quite high. In healthcare, power distance can occur between different professional groups, between leaders and staff, or even between clinical and non-clinical individuals. We must all be aware of the power distance that is perceived around us and modulate that by including others, asking for opinions, and help to demonstrate our commitment to being a good teammate. The final You Are Responsible tool is encouraging problem, error, and event reporting. A strong safety culture includes good processes for detection and correction, as well as prevention. Robust reporting of events, as well as safety concerns or accidents waiting to happen, is critical. Leaders can't fix problems they don't know about. Team members should actively encourage each other to report and use IRIS when a process problem is identified, when an error or mistake has happened, and after the occurrence of an event. Help your peers identify events that should be reported by providing examples. Do not assume that everyone knows what should or should not be reported. By defining items that should be reported, we are providing clarity as leaders and have an opportunity to detect and correct before a serious event occurs. Lastly, leaders should plan communications following the submission of an event report to close the loop with the employee or provider that submitted the report. This action ensures that reports keep coming. Additionally, when you follow up, employees and providers talk about this. If people feel as though they are heard through event reporting, the reports will keep coming. That concludes the tools in our Universal Skills Toolkit. Here we see, again, the list of values from Common Spirit, as well as our ways of behaving, which describe the tools that we use to pr promote and support a safety environment. With all of this new information, we're asking for your commitment to do the following. Commit to memorizing our universal skills. Just like a telephone number or home address, once you commit them to long-term memory, they are always there. We must know them in order to create a common language around safety that will make it clear to one another that safety always comes first. Start using these universal skills today as soon as we return to our places of work. Encourage each other to use the tools and techniques. Identify situations when these tools did or could have prevented human error. We must drive these behaviors into practice habit, and the only way to achieve this goal is to use them each and every day. Start recognizing the different human error modes in which you operate as you recognize yours and others' errors each day. Share safety success stories when you hear about someone using a tone or tool to prevent harm. In closing today, I want to share a video made by one of your sister hospitals where they discuss the importance of this work for the patients they serve and the employees working in their facility. I hope that you've enjoyed this learning and that you will commit to putting these very simple universal skills into place for the patients you serve and the employees committed to your organization. got some minor injuries. We're going to put in an IV, give him some morphine for his pain. Your little boy is going to be just fine. Probably everybody that works in this industry has at some point or another been part of an error or a mistake, whether they realized it at the time or not. Did you get that? Let's give him some morphine, one milligram IV. And it only takes just a momentary lapse in reason or judgment. Only a second. What do you need? I just need to know exactly what the doctor wants. My biggest fear is that I'm going to let my patients down. I don't think any person gets into the medical field with the intention of harming any patient. Morphine's going to make your arm 
alarm feels a lot better. So. But the reality is we're human, so we make mistakes. We have no heart rate. How much morphine did you give him? Okay. We have a what's called a serious safety event here on an average of every four days. So pick a day, I can give you a story. They come in with the intent to do everything they can to do the right way, the way they learn, and then they make an error and their life crumbles. I consider every patient that comes in our door as my patient the same way I consider my family. Nothing gets your attention like having to go and tell them, um, um, tell them we made a mistake. I've seen heart surgeons and neurosurgeons, tears in their eyes in my office. That's very, very sad. You, you never forget. Our patients come to us with their, with their lives that deserve nothing less but perfect care. There isn't anything more important for us to do. Let's design highly reliable systems that help people prevent harm. It's the right thing to do. It makes sense. It's common sense when you learn these techniques. The first time, the way we achieve exceptional performance that we hold ourselves to is going to be built into the way we work. Medicine used to be a very top-down system. It's become much more complex. Medicine is now a team sport. When you make mistakes, the best checks and balances are the other team members. Whether it's working in food services, environmental services, or in an administrative office like I work, every single one of us plays an important role in safe care. This is a journey that we're going to take. We are changing culture, and we have to have the passion, and we have to have the excitement, and we have to have the tenacity to go through and do it, and we as leaders must lead it. It's a paradigm shift. It's a change in the way that you go about doing your daily job. If you don't change how you believe and how you think, it's not going to work. We all have to work together because ultimately we're all here for the same goal. We're all here to take care of our patients. What if our processes were so reliable that you couldn't possibly give the wrong medication? What if we took the time to do it right the first time? What if no one was ever again worried about approaching another practitioner? What if we never had to have those hard conversations. What if we could always think of the patient first? I'd really love to work in that kind of world. What if? Thank you for your attendance today and for your commitment to keeping each other and our patients safe. If you have any questions or would like a list of references for the material presented in this presentation, please contact the medical staff office at Arizona General Hospital. Thank you for your time.